Good afternoon everybody, this is Dr. Jeff Colbert, Schoolies Mountain Chiropractic Center, and today we're going a little bit old school. And what do I mean by old school? In the old days we used to do in-house lectures on the back school, the immune system, stress reduction, better sleep, better posture, sitting on the job. But due to COVID and unfortunately rising gas prices and inflation, people just don't like to come back out for a second visit on a particular day to get some of this information. So we are going, taking old school and bringing it to you new school. So today's presentation, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about living with a healthy back or our presentation of the back school. And why do we do this is because, again, it's a community service for you, our patient, but again, it gives you the information that we need you to have so that you can be as proactive in your recovery as possible, therefore allowing you to get well as quickly as possible, saving you both time and money in our office. So without any further ado, okay, we're gonna get started with the presentation of the back school. So the thing that you need to realize and recognize is that back pain in this country is epidemic. Eight out of 10 people will suffer some form of back pain during the duration of their lifetime. And even a scarier statistic than that is that 90% of that 80% will repeat within one to five years of their original injury, getting injury compounded on top of injury. So this is one of the reasons why we take a very proactive approach at Schoolies Mountain Chiropractic Center. We want to address the problem, we want to know what's there and what's creating the problem. We want to be able to provide you relief, but we also want to provide you with the armamentarium and the information that you can transition from relief care to something that is known as corrective care, where we really literally rebuild the spine and the musculature so that the likelihood of the problem coming back becomes further and further remote. If you go through corrective care, studies have shown that the incident of repeat tends to be once within five to seven years versus ending at relief care where the problem comes back within six months to two years. Typically in relief care, each episode gets worse. In corrective care, you're doing so many things right for such a long period of time, it's generally a very, very quick and easy fix when that occurs. So again, it is epidemic in this country, and again, eight out of 10 are going to experience it, nine out of those eight out of 10 are going to repeat the episode within about a five year period of time. Low back pain costs the United States an estimated $75 billion a year in healthcare costs. So again, it does take a lot of money and it takes, you know, the one thing I've learned in being a, not only a doctor but a business, when you're spending time, you're wasting money. And if you're spending a lot of money, you're wasting time. So this cuts down on the productivity of the country as well as the productivity in your life in terms of taking care of your kids, your husband, your family, your spouse, you know, whatever you need to do when you're spending this much money, it's robbing you of the time that you need to do things in your life successfully. What causes the stress on your back? Well, there's a number of things that will end up creating the stress that ultimately weakens your back to create the problem. Again, it can be something as simple as the birth process, how that baby is being born. Is it a normal, easy delivery? Is it breach? Is there a complication? Is there a C-section that's going on? So again, birth is one of the first traumas that are going to occur. Obviously, we have falls, okay, that can create trauma to the spine. Medications, you know, you don't have to look very far these days to know that there are a ton of medications out there, typically heart and blood pressure medications, that are going to create some form of lower back, lower extremity, joint type of aches and pains. So again, you never can rule out what's going on with a medication in terms of side effects. Preservatives and foods. This is something that you always have to be careful of again, because just like a medication, the preservatives that are going into the food are added chemicals and every added chemical that comes into your body is going to have some form of side effect that is going to be applied to you. That can create a weakening of muscles, those weakening of muscles again typically associated with the digestive system or the immune system are going to have an impact on what goes on to your spine and as the spine goes so goes the vertebra the vertebra pinches the nerve creates the pain creates the weakness and the problem that goes on just as fall sports related injuries car accidents emotional stress as well as not breastfeeding babies and then the effect of gravity affecting us when we're not maintaining the curves of our spine so these are just some of the things that we can elaborate on when you're here in the office. If you're curious as to what are some of the causes that can be creating your back pain on a more repetitive basis as opposed to a single event. 
Every day we injure our backs. You know, it's not uncommon that moms or dads are carrying kids on one hip. We're bending over at the waist, forgetting to squat at our hips and knees. So again, if you think that nothing is happening just because you're not experiencing symptoms, sometimes this is literally the camel that breaks the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak. You know, 3,000 straws thrown on the camel, no problem. 3,001, it weighs a couple of ounces and the camel goes down like a, a ton of bricks. So every day we are potentially injuring our backs. The scenario gets to be a familiar one. An employee, in this case, is, lifts and twists and crumbles to the ground in pain. But it doesn't necessarily have to be an employee, okay? It can be you at your house. I mean, I've made house calls to people when they've been in the shower, they bend over to pick up the bar of soap or to pick up the towel that falls, and the next thing you know, they're on the floor, in the shower, in intense pain, and I'm getting an emergency phone call. So whether it's something in and around the house or it's on the job, you bend, you twist, you lift the wrong way, and the muscle says, I can't support this. It creates the proverbial pop, the pinch, and the nerve gets irritated and you collapse to the ground in pain. Uh, and the process that's about to ensue uh, could become a nightmare of disability, high costs, legal battles, and fractured lives. So this gets to be rather serious when a back starts to go out. As days pass, frustration and anxiety can begin to surface within the employee or within the person because you're not sure of what your next move is. Should I go to a doctor? Should I see an attorney? Should I you know, get a referral from a friend? Um, you feel abandoned and you feel helpless and at the mercy and the will of the opinions of other people and practitioners who cannot answer the most basic question. What's wrong with my back? When will it stop hurting? And what's the next step in the process? So back pain, uh, am I the cause? Wear and tear on the spine is responsible for 90% of all of the back pain. Seven out of 10 cases are due to postural fatigue and sprains and strains to the back. That means we are in control of it. If we watch our posture, we watch out for how we're lifting and how we're doing things, we can eliminate a lot of the problems that tend to weaken us. The problem that we get into as human beings is if we do something the first time and it doesn't hurt, we assume it's okay, but that could just be the slow chipping, okay, like somebody chips away at the foundation of a house and it's not the first chip that causes the house to collapse, but when you get to 3,874, okay, chips away, the foundation crumbles. So again, most of the time we are responsible for poor postures, bending, twisting, and lifting the wrong way, and that all can be prevented. You are also the strength. Increasing a worker's strength increases their health. Increasing a worker's productivity, increasing companies' products and sales, increasing companies' strength and longevity. But we can also translate this not only into a worker, but we can translate this to a husband, to a wife, to a kid who's playing sports, that it's going to be the same thing. When you're increasing your strength, you increase your health. You increase the productivity for whatever you have to do, whether that's on the job, on the field, or in the home. And obviously, the more you can do to keep yourself healthy, the more it's gonna cut down on healthcare costs and ultimately increases your longevity because of the things that you get to do with the people that you love, when you wanna do them, where you wanna do them, whenever you wanna do them. Okay, my definition of true health. So you have to know your disc, your back, and what's going on with each area of the body and how to tell which one is being more productive or not. So in your back or in your spine, you're gonna have the discs, which are the spongy spacers between the vertebra. You have the nerve, which comes out between a hole that's created because of the body and the disc. You have the joints that guide the motions and the muscles that create the movement. And there's generally a pretty easy way to tell you know, is it a disc, is it a joint, or is it a muscle? And obviously when there's pain going on there from a chiropractic standpoint, that creates the vertebral subluxation. The vertebral subluxation is where the vertebra twists and moves a little bit out of place. And that ultimately is going to pinch the nerve that is going to affect muscle, joint, organ, gland, or skin. Wherever that nerve is gonna go, something's gonna have some aberrant function. So when you're dealing with your lower back, 
and we're talking about a disc, when you come into the office, the first question I'm going to ask you when you're describing your lower back pain will be, does it hurt when you cough, sneeze, laugh, or try to have a bowel movement? If that extra pressure from the cough, the sneeze, the laugh, or when you're trying to bear and push out a bowel movement creates pain, I know at some level you've irritated the disc in the spine. Okay, because what happens is you cough or sneeze, laugh or push, pressure from the lungs hit the abdomen, the pressure in the abdomen hits the veins, the vein causes the disc to swell or bulge, and that puts pressure on the nerve which creates the pain. So that's a very easy way to let me know at some level, whether it's an inflamed disc, a bulging disc, or a herniated disc, you cough or sneeze, it's going to create some pain. The next one is going to be the joint. And one of the easiest ways that we can tell whether it's a joint or a muscle is I'm going to have you go through a range of motion. And while you're actively moving, there's going to be some kind of nudge or irritation or some pain that's caused. So if you've got pain on forward bending or lateral bending or leaning backwards, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to resist you in those motions. So if you bend forward and it hurts, and then I resist you and I'm holding you and you try to bend forward, if there's pain when you try to bend forward, that's the muscle contracting. I know you've got a muscular component going on. If when I'm resisting you and you try to bend forward, there's no pain, I know that's the joint because the muscle's contracting, but the muscle's doing its thing, it's contracting, there's no pain, there's no irritation. It's only when that joint moves and stretches those ligaments and the nerve endings into the joint that it's creating pain that I start to ascertain, do we have a disc, do we have a joint, do we have a muscle or do we have some combination of all those three pinching and irritating the nerve? So look at your posture. Do you have a curve in the neck and the curve in the lower back and the curve in the middle back? You have curves when you look at the side of your body because it acts as a spring and dissipates the weight evenly throughout all the segments of the spine. If the spine is too straight in the neck, middle back, or lower back, gravity and the weight of your body and the things that you're lifting over time is going to start to create those discs to want to compress down over time. Do you have a scoliosis, that side-to-side -side S curvature when you're looking at somebody front on? Again, there'll be certain muscles that are weak with that, certain muscles that are tight that want to promote that. Do you have an uneven pelvis? Trust me, 95% of us are walking around with a pelvis that's a little bit out of balance. It's not because of leg length inequality. It's because we love to stand like we're waiting for a bus and being cocked. Or we're carrying stuff on a hip like kids. And as we stand with uneven posture, eventually certain muscles will start to tighten, others will get overstretched, and we end up having a pelvic distortion, which ultimately leads to a short leg more on one side than the other. One of the first things that happen when you come into the office, I'm always looking at your leg length because I know what's going on with the leg length is a reflection to what's going on in the pelvis and the lower back and ultimately what's going on the rest of the spine. Do you create forward head carriage, that forward head lean, rounded shoulders as you slouch, slouching posture, uh, too much or too little of a low back curve always creates a problem. So it mirrors your back's health. As the posture goes, so go you, you go. So posture that's poor creates stress on the nervous system. Good posture reduces the stress and tension on the spine and the nervous system. Essentials for the curve. There needs to be great strength into the musculature of the spine. You have to have flexibility, resilience. The discs need to absorb shock and be able to, to handle the pounding that you're giving it. Proper opening. You know, all these little holes in the back, those are where the nerves come out. So if the disc is too compressed, there's arthritis, the joints are jamming. Again, this hole where the nerve comes out is going to start to compress and irritate that nerve. And because there's arteries and veins that circulate through there too, again, the essential curve for great circulation. And again, the more we're bringing blood into the area, the more there's nutrients, the more we have a healthy spine, healthy disc, healthy ligaments, and healthy muscles. Act before it's too late. Always remember, weight-bearing joints degenerate first. Those are your spine, your hips, your knees, your feet, okay? Osteoarthritis is a disease of wear and tear, okay? You can take steps to limit arthritis. Remember, degeneration occurs within six hours of joint immobilization. And this gets to be really important on a number of different factors. 
And when you injure yourself or you do something that creates a spinal subluxation, that joint becomes fixated. And you're going to have some kind of level of pain or discomfort. And the typical time frame for that will be as little as one to three days. You will typically feel discomfort for most people on an initial injury. The more repetitive that that injury is, the longer that irritation and inflammation is going to be there. But in as little as three days, your body will lock into that fixated pattern as its normal pattern. And in as little as a week to two weeks, that sets up a total degenerative process starting. So if you hurt yourself and you think in a day or two you're feeling better, that everything is fine, I would ask you to please reconsider that thinking. Make sure you get your spine checked. If there is a spinal subluxation there, it's an easy adjustment. And if it's a quick one, two, three type of thing, a visit or two or three, and we know we've got the joint working and properly functioning again, it stops that degenerative process. If you sit there and go, I'm not in pain, so I must be fine, in as little as two weeks, that can set up the degenerative process so that in six months, two years, three years, five years, seven years, when the injury has come back repetitively, when we go in and take x-rays, if we see some form of arthritis, you're going to have to sit there and say, okay, I have to take ownership that I hurt myself as little as it seemed at the time. Seven years later, we've got the start of a degenerative arthritic process. So again, don't take no pain, not a problem, as I'm healthy. No, I had pain, it signified that there was a problem. Go get it checked. Once it's checked and taken care of, then from there you can stretch out your care or stretch out your visits as long as you need to. But again, pain is a very poor indicator of a problem or ill health exists because typically pain is the last thing that shows up and is oftentimes the first thing that goes away. Prevention. Always remember that you should be lifting right right from the get-go. So always maintain great posture. Okay, lift with your legs. Try not to lean or bend or twist too far forward because that will create a longer lever arm. Keep the objects close to your body. Have strong abdomen or a strong core. Do exercises every day that are going to help keep your back strong. You know, we give our patients typically when they first come in the 90-90 stretch where they're laying down on their back, bending their hip, bending their knee, and just laying on a bed or the floor for 15-20 minutes a couple of times a day just to open up those facet joints in the disc. Pelvic tilts, knees to chest exercise, partial sit-ups, all really important for s developing muscles that are going to keep your back healthy and strong. And always keep your back extended, maintaining that low back curve when you are trying to lift. This picture gets to be really important because it says so much for how we build pressure in our spine. When you're looking at a person lying down on their back, lying on their side, standing, standing and leaning forward, sitting and sitting and leaning forward, what you start to notice is there is a dramatic increase in pressure on the spine. So when you're laying down in bed at night, preferably on your back with a pillow underneath your knees and a pillow to support your neck, you have about 25 pounds of pressure per square inch on your discs. The simple act of rolling to your side triples that pressure to 75 pounds. So I can't tell you how many times, and you may have experienced this in the past, when your back is hurt, just the act of rolling to your side is, is sometimes excruciatingly painful. Standing, standing puts about four times the amount of pressure versus lying down does. So now you're going from 25 pounds of pressure to about 75 pounds of pressure to 100 pounds of pressure. When you stand and bend forward, you've got literally almost six times the amount of pressure per square inch on your back. Now here gets to be the real kicker, because I can't tell you how many times people said, how did I hurt my back? All I do is sit all day, okay? But again, when you're sitting, sitting and standing and bending forward have almost the same amount of pressure on them per square inch. But when you sit and you slouch at a desk or a computer all day long, that literally has about eight times the amount of pressure per square inch versus lying down. So one of the worst things you can do when you hurt your back is just think, I'm just gonna sit and I'm not doing anything. Standing, as long as you're standing erect, is far better than standing and leaning forward like at a counter or a sink when you're washing your face or brushing your teeth or shaving or when you're doing the dishes or loading a dishwasher or doing stuff with the laundry. 
you don't want to try to favor this position unless you're already remembering to squat down. Your best positions when you hurt the back are lying down or standing and try to avoid that standing and leaning forward or sitting and sitting and leaning forward. So this slide gets to be critically important for everybody to understand because again, everybody thinks in a society where we're more sedentary that I'm only sitting so I'm not doing anything. Tremendous amount of pressure that builds per square inch on your back. Okay, so rules for stretching and reaching. Always plan your activity from start to finish. Face your load, don't twist, okay? Uh, secure your position, tilt your pelvis, and keep the abdomen firm. Get a stool if you can reach for an object with both hands. Okay, so for sitting, okay? Sit, lower back should be supported. So again, always make sure you're not sitting too far forward in the chair and slouching. You put your butt at that back uh, third of the chair. Feet, both feet should be flat on the floor. If there's an armrest, rest your arms on the armrest and use that armrest to get up and down. Uh, when you're bending from a seated position, be sure not to twist because again, remember all of that extra pressure that builds. Avoid sitting on the floor, especially sitting Indian style, because that always tends to flare your sacroiliac joint in the back. Consciously keep your back straight when getting in and out of the chair. Push off the armrests or use your thighs while using your legs to get up and down. Rule of thumb, when you're sitting, knees should be always slightly higher than your hips. Same thing in the car. Rules for bending and reaching. Support your weight with your free hand. Okay, so if you gotta reach for something, make sure you've got your hands supported. Uh, reaching over any surface, desk, or table. Be crouching, uh, squatting, or kneeling. Okay, use your thighs or an obstacle to support your weight. Uh, when bending and reaching below shoulder level, support your weight and maintain your lumbar curve. It's called bend and bow. And when reaching at or above shoulder level, remember the pelvic tilt. And here's something that throws everybody for a loop. Anytime you take your hands past parallel to the floor, it's an automatic start to pinch your lower back. So by maintaining that pelvic tilt, that slight tightening of the abdomen, the tightening of the buttock, and that pelvis tilting forward, okay, gets you to open up those facet joints, open up the discs, so when you're reaching up above, it's not pinching nearly as much. Okay, again, short lever arm versus long lever arm. Longer the lever arm, the greater the pressure that's on the lower back. Shorter the lever arm, the less pressure that's on the back. So you want to keep that close, lift with your legs versus bending and twisting at your waist. So when you're lifting, again, plan your lift. Bend and bow that back. Always keep your nose in line with your belly button or in between your toes. Bend with your knees and lift with your legs, not with your back. Set your abdomen just like Atlas would when he's lifting the world. Evaluate the weight. Is this heavy enough? that I can lift it by myself, or is it too heavy that I should get some help? So challenge the weight before you do it. Keep it close with a firm grip, and remember to pivot your body, not to twist your body, okay? Studies have gone out and shown that the more you bend and twist at the waist, even as something as little as five to 10 pounds, much greater wear and tear on your spine than trying to lift one or two things really heavy, but doing it properly. The thing that I want you to get away from this slide is it does not take a heavy weight to build a lot of pressure in your spine. And every Thanksgiving, and we're coming up to Thanksgiving right now, I implore everybody to realize this. There are what is known as factored load weights that get applied to your spine. So for a 200 pound man, when he's standing upright, just like I am, 75% of his body weight is being exerted on those discs and joints in the lower back. So that turns into 150 pounds. The act of bending over at the waist, okay, and not doing that straight back bend, increases that factored load weight six times. So 150 pounds on your back when you bend over quickly becomes 900 pounds. And then you have to add on the weight plus six times that weight of anything that you're trying to lift. So it's very easy to see that if you're trying to lift a 100 pound box, that becomes 600 pounds. And with your factored load weight at 900, when you bend over to pick up 100 pounds, if you're not lifting it properly, that's 1,500 pounds of pressure on your back. So if we do this same scenario, okay, with a gentleman who's helping his wife in the kitchen,
They're making a 25 pound bird, okay, and he weighs 200 pounds. He opens up the door to the oven, he bends in, pulls out with the mitts, and is lifting up a 25 pound bird. 150 pounds times six is 900 plus the weight of a 25 pound bird times six now is 150 pounds. So as he's bending over, he's got 1,050 pounds coming up and putting it onto the counter, his back goes. He's thinking he lifted a 25 pound turkey. He doesn't realize he had over 1,000 pounds of pressure. And if I ask any one of you what would it be like to lift and carry a thousand pounds? You know you couldn't do it, but you ask your back to do something like that every single day, repetitively throughout the day, not thinking about factored load weights. So proper methods for pushing and pulling. Again, you want to determine whether the apparatus can move gracefully over the surface that you're on. Know whether it's going to slide or roll appropriately over the surface. You know, if it's a smooth floor versus a carpet versus gravel versus grass. Okay, keep your body loose so that if it starts to go, you have the freedom to go and let go. Uh, get low and when you're pushing, push with your legs, okay, rather than with your upper body and keep your lower back straight at all times, that lower back bend. And literally the same thing applies for when you're pulling. And if you had to ever choose between, am I gonna push this object or pull it? I find it's typically easier to pull than it is to push. But again, evaluate the weight, examine the surface, pull, walk backwards. Again, slight bend and tilt of the head to see where you're going, okay? Because you always wanna know where you're going at all times. And you're walking it back with that straight back bend. Common excuses for why we let ourselves get injured and hurt. I was in a hurry. There was nobody around to ask for help and I knew it was gonna to be too heavy but I had to do it anyway. Didn't wanna ask for help, this is real common among men, and I just didn't think that I'd end up getting hurt from this. So avoid injuries at all time, always ask for help when you need help. Okay, avoid re-injury. Keep your spine strong. You know, when everybody comes into the office, they always ask, hey doc, what exercises can I do so this never comes back? Well, in the beginning, the first thing we need to do is kill the inflammation and start to get some relief in there and balance some tone to the muscles, right, left, front, and back. Get some balance going into the pelvis, into the spine. But once we get you into an exercise routine, it is incumbent upon you to remember to do it daily. And most importantly, do your stretches when you don't have pain because that's the sign that the inflammation is down and now we want to really go full boat. Remember, out of pain does not mean out of problem. Stretch must be simple to do, okay? You must understand why you're doing the stretches and again, remember, the biggest goal is corrective care and we don't want to repeat the problem. So assign that purpose to it. Remember that joints need motion and this is something that's critically important for everybody to understand. Everybody wants to be careful when they hurt their back, but remember, a spine that is mobile heals faster than a spine that is immobile, okay? So we will give you a little rule. We want to try, have you to try, and I implore the word try to engage into some normal activities as soon as you possibly can after you've injured your back. But there is a caveat to that. If you're doing something and it hurts, you don't keep doing it. You have to stop and get some ice on it. The next caveat is you've done something, it doesn't hurt during the activity, but an hour, two or three later, you're starting to notice I'm getting a little achy from what I did. In which case, you're still gonna get ice onto it, but then you're gonna modify your duration or intensity so that the next time you go back to that activity, you'll hopefully find your sweet spot that you can do an activity without over intensifying and out going too long. So for some people when it's, I've got to vacuum the house, I vacuum the entire house, I'm dying. Okay, well let's kill that intensity by only vacuuming one room or two rooms and see how you feel. If you can do one or two rooms safely, then we know you have a one to two room capacity for that bending, twisting with the vacuum. If it hurts to do even one room, we stop, but we're not ready to do the vacuuming there yet. So it's just common sense to figure out how active can I be while mobilizing the spine, but not being so active that I irritate the tissue that creates the inflammation that gets it started again. And then uh, rebuild with proper nutrients, 
uh, to limit the degeneration. And again, we can talk about water, its importance, vitamins and minerals, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, that type of stuff. So that again, you're getting the building blocks in to help rehydrate the spine and make the tissue stronger than it was originally. Okay, rescue your back, the choice is yours. You can choose to do stretching, exercises, incorporate lifestyle changes, work on your posture, get adjusted, and modify how you do things, or you can simply shift over to medicine, surgery, and bed rest. And remember, every medication has a side effect. There is always an outcome and ramification to surgery in terms of how it affects your body. And we know the more that you're sitting in bed and resting, lacking the mobility that your spine needs, the longer it's gonna take for you to get well. Stretching is important whether you use it as part of your everyday exercise program, uh, as a preventative measure or as part of your rehabilitation for your injury. Okay, when we're talking about an exercise program for your spine, there's five components that you have to make sure that are there for it. First one is cardiovascular fitness, then there's strength, then there's balance, endurance, and flexibility. So if you can keep that and knowing that stretching is gonna make you flexible, it will help you tremendously in the recovery process. Remember, this is the only spine you get. You better take care of it because if you wear it out, where are you going to live? So this is our presentation of our back school. I hope you found this information useful and helpful. If you liked it, if you could hit like and then subscribe and share this with other people so that again, we get the information out there, not only for you, but for your friends and family, how they can be proactive and take care of their spine, limiting the amount of time that they're gonna have to be in a chiropractic office, medical office, physical therapy, occupational therapy. It only helps them in the long run. So if you hit like and subscribe, I'd greatly appreciate it. In the meantime, if you think that you've liked something here and you want to share it with somebody, please remember they can always visit our website, wwwsmcc 4 u visit our patient section, give us a call, shoot us an email, download the new patient information forms, and always feel free to visit our office whenever there's a healthcare need that arises because we like to think Schoolies Mountain Chiropractic Center is your leader in alternative healthcare. Thank you very much and have a great night.